All right, y'all, here's how to support the show. Uh, first of all, uh, sign up for the RSS feeds so that you don't miss a show. Um, libertarianinstitute.org or scotthorton.org for those. Also, subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash scotthortonshow. And um, sign up at Patreon. Anybody who donates a dollar or more per interview at patreon.com, you get two free audio books, and that can be including my book, uh, narrated by me, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. So uh, help support that way. Sign up at patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. And um, uh, send in 50 bucks at scotthorton.org slash donate. You get a signed copy of... The uh, book Fool's Errand of the paperback there. And anybody who donates $100, uh, used to be It Takes Two. Now for any donation of $100, you get a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think Libertarian audiobooks. And there's already a whole bunch of them and there will be more. Uh, lifetime subscription for any $100 donation to The Scott Horton Show uh, from Listen and Think Audio. Uh, or you can get a silver QR code commodity disc, which is a really cool currency. Uh, silver, one ounce disc uh with a qr code tells you the instant spot price on there and um just go scotthorton.org slash donate there's also a paypal for single donations or you can sign up uh, to do monthly donations on paypal as well and um take all different kinds of digital currencies especially zencash zensystem.io for zencash and of course all the different kinds of bitcoins and etc like that um, so check all that out at scotthorton.org slash donate. And hey, by the way, if you like this show, uh, review it for me on iTunes, Stitcher, etc. Uh, if you like the audio book, it's now available on iTunes as well as audible.com. So leave a good review on there if you like that and, uh, help get that out. Thanks. Sorry, I'm late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing they army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, it's Grant F. Smith on the line, our good friend from the Institute for Research, Middle Eastern policy welcome to the show how you doing very well scott very well thanks for having me on good to have you on hey uh you wrote big israel about the israel lobby and also you wrote divert about them stealing weapons grade uranium uh from the united states the israeli government that is their spies and um all about the trade wars and what is it it's what six eight books about the israel lobby and their legal and illegal antics in the united states correct that is correct. And uh, if I could write another one just in like a week, it would be called Project Pinto, which was the Arnon Milchan, Benjamin Netanyahu smuggling ring that got a hold of a bunch of nuclear triggers back in the day. But yeah, I'm getting what I'm a getting... great story that is. Isn't it, <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it funny the ratio between what a big story that is and what a big story it wasn't? Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> sent a tweet to Ann Applebaum of the Washington Post uh -huh. because she was saying something about, well, it's certain that North Korea is spinning up their centrifuges. And oh. I said, by the way, have you ever heard of Netanyahu and the, the Krytron heist? And why is it the Washington Post has never written word number one about that? And uh, still waiting, still waiting. Oh, you mean she response. didn't immediately give you no. the due respect to give no. you an honest answer about what was and going that's on? And that's what I expected, of course. I expected, you know, <laughs> that the leading newspaper here in Washington would would leap all over that because it's such a great story. But I think it went up on uh, antiwar.com in 2012. And uh, I guess I have to credit um, 
national public radio of all places for at least mentioning it uh, a couple of months ago, but uh, it didn't get any traction there either. Well, that's interesting, though, that they would. Right, right. That's the kind of thing where it only comes out if they don't really realize the politics. Whatever news editors work in that day doesn't is a little bit, you know, not up to date on what you're never supposed to let through and kind of accidentally does. It was a throwaway line about Milchan and the Netanyahu uh, pink champagne uh, controversy, as if that was even important. And uh, it was a throwaway line. So you're right about that. All right. So. Let's talk about this. I had no idea about this. And when I first read about this, I says to myself, no way. Really? Huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Geez. The, the Israelis make the American presidents or their national security staff put it in writing that they will Abs- not talk about Israeli nuclear weapons. I've got to put it to the New Yorker and Antum Entaus. He is an amazing writer. And not only is the article linked in that four presidents conspired to give $100 billion to Israel uh, right at the top that's at antiwar.com. But he, he links his own articles, and they're, they're absolutely astounding about the secret commitments and uh, all of the antics that have been taking place. And then, of course, he goes all the way back to Bill Clinton, which is even better. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, apparently, um, apparently these letters don't actually have bullet point number one. I hereby swear never to mention Israel's nuclear program, uh, nuclear weapons program. uh, Number two, I hereby swear that I will never investigate seriously the ongoing diversions of technology from the U.S. Number, they don't say that. They simply make it very clear that the U.S., uh, speaking in euphemisms, will not... uh, do anything to jeopardize Israel's deterrent, strategic deterrent capabilities, which are a lot of really weaselly words for saying, we're not going to mention your nuclear weapons. Hmm. You know what, man? There's this old anecdote that I'm sure you remember about Bill Clinton, who had already mm-hmm. been the president for four years at this point, uh, right. or three and a half years or something at this point, when Netanyahu first came into the prime ministership in 1996. And when, or it may have even been before that, but it was just, it was the first time he ever met Netanyahu. I forget whether it was, he was prime minister. I think he was prime minister, the incoming prime minister at the time. And that Bill Clinton reportedly after the meeting said, who in the F does this guy think he is? Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, I can't believe what just happened here. You know, where he just came in and started reading Bill Clinton, the riot act. Like, here are your marching orders, punk. And Bill was like, hey, I'm the emperor of the world, dude. You're just the prime minister of a little Maryland size nothing. So let me tell you about the way things are for a minute. He just couldn't believe it. And now I think I wonder if that's what this was about. Out. Was him it going, is. It sign is because, it, bitch. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's amazing because that same reaction came from uh, Trump's staff, who said to right. Ron Dermer, "This is our effing house. What do you think you're doing here? You can't demand this." And he was making all of these. Now, wait, tell that story in a little more detail there, as he reports it here, if you could, please, about what happened with that. Right. Well, I mean, the Israelis came in in a very sensitive time when they're just about to dispatch uh, Michael Flynn, the national security advisor. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was going to hand in his resignation letter. And uh, Ron Dermer, former American, now current Israeli ambassador to the U.S., basically came in and he said, uh, I I need to have uh, Flynn in the room. I need this guy. I need that guy. And he obviously didn't know that Flynn was on his way out. Uh, Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have made that demand. And and that just made everyone snap, saying, look, you don't come in here with a letter or a set of points you want to make us sign uh, and demand uh, the people you want in the room. That's not how it works here. Uh, But, you know, he got the letter signed anyway. And, of course... I knew this from doing Freedom of Information Act requests. There's virtually no handoff of National Security Council information from one administration to the other. And all of the presidential libraries are like locked boxes where the National Security Council stuff is under lock and key, never to be released. So Americans think that there's a lot of continuity on the NSC uh, and where there's not. 
And uh, nobody knew about these letters except the Israelis who had all four of them. Hmm. And that's so funny, too, because we're talking about Jared Kushner here, right? Ron Dermer and, and Jared Kushner. They don't get along. Like Dermer couldn't have said, "Oh, hey, Jared, there's this thing when you get to a, you know, we'd like to talk to you about." But they would, like, in, in other words, if you're the Israeli side in this, why the need for the imperious attitude, dude? These are your friends here. Obviously, they're gonna sign whatever you need them to sign. But they can't even be cool about it. They have to be so demanding that they get pushback even from. You know, Benjamin Netanyahu's godson, Jared right. Kushner, for God's yeah. sake, you know? Right, the guy who gave, gave up his bedroom, as we all have heard, ad nauseum, so that BB could sleep there. Um, well, it's just, uh, I think it's a, a matter of trajectory and a doctrine within the Israeli side, which is, and the lobby here, there's not, never enough that you can do. And so the attitude is, you can never do enough for us. And so why aren't you jumping higher or moving faster when we come in to bestow our latest request upon you? So yep. it's uh, it's terrible. And I think the great piece that he wrote, which is a little bit longer, this is Adam Entos in The New Yorker, Donald Trump's New World Order, uh, really goes into detail about all these requests and that there is contention, with, you know, from the outside – because they've returned to this horrible policy um, of no daylight, something that Michael Oren, another former American, former ambassador back to the U.S. from Israel, always insisted upon that the U.S. has always got to present this public face that there's never any disagreement with the Israelis, that right. uh, the U.S. and Israel have these inherent interests that are exactly the same and so there should never be any daylight between the two but what entos re reveals is that there's a lot of daylight and uh he's exposing that daylight yeah well and again and i'm sorry i meant to say this at the beginning but i said so many things that this wasn't one of them four presidents conspired to give a hundred billion to israel Secret right. White House letters buttress ongoing U.S. Arms Control Act violations. This isn't actually the – is this the same one I was looking for? Oh, yeah, it is. It's about the Adam. Yeah, that's the one. That's yeah. the one. And I don't think the word conspire is too much because basically the dictionary definition is make secret plans jointly to commit an unlawful or harmful act. Mm. And, and so – and and this, yeah. is the, this is the real rub here about why the – pseudo secrecy over israel's nukes i mean i got tweets of me and um mordecai vanunu on twitter talking about they got 200 nukes it's not a right. secret grant seriously that happened um and right. so right uh everybody knows but so the reason that they have to pretend though that oh yeah no nobody knows if israel has nukes or not is because they're breaking the law if they admit that israel has nukes and they're outside the npt and this and that and, and how's that exactly well, the <clears throat> Export Control Act, is that what it is? Yeah, it's the U.S. Arms Export Control Act. It's the Symington and Glenn amendments uh, that make it uh, unlawful to keep giving U.S. foreign aid to any country that's outside the MPT and found to be trafficking in nuclear weapons technology, not to mention building an arsenal and de uh, deploying the weapons. So, um, and, you know, also mentions things like testing these. Uh, the test, uh, the Vela incident, which took place, it's uh, you know, most of the people who are honest about it within governments, like uh, uh, Viktor Galinsky, the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, say just flat outright that was an Israeli nuclear test. But anyway, uh, these amendments, which are now found in the U.S. Arms Export Control Act, require the president to at very least – issue public waivers to Congress saying, uh, I recognize that this is a nuclear weapons country outside the MPT. However, we must continue foreign aid because it's in the strategic or the national interests of the United States. I think they'd have an extremely hard time making that argument. And I think anybody uh, who had serious, you know, sort of uh, realist foreign policy experience uh, put a John Mearsheimer or Stephen Walt up in front of that argument and they would shred it to little pieces. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, the real reason that Entos does not go into why is this happening is exactly that. You can't keep violating uh, this piece of the Arms Export Control Act, which I believe they'd have a very hard time, you know, adding some sort of modification to it that would somehow exclude Israel. They haven't done it. I doubt they will do it. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? What do you do if it's on the book and you have to you know, appear to be giving aid in an, a lawful way, you just don't admit the obvious, the thing mm -hmm. that everybody knows. And that is no president has ever uh, come out and said while in office that they have a nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. All right. Hang on just one second. Hey, guys, here's who sponsors this show. Mike Swanson and his great investment advice at WallStreetWindow.com. He's actually uh, posting some stuff at the Libertarian Institute website now. Really great stuff. The great Mike Swanson. And he's also the author of the book, The War State, which is a really great history of the rise of the new right military industrial complex after World War II in the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy eras. You'll really want to look at it. The War State by Mike Swanson. Also, Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. If you listen to Mike, you'll be buying some metals. You'll want to buy them from Roberts and Roberts. They've been around as long as I've been alive. They've got a great reputation. They take the very smallest premium possible in order to uh, help arrange the very best sales for you at uh, of uh, platinum, palladium, gold, silver, of course, and no premium at all if you buy with Bitcoin. They're at Roberts and Roberts. That's rrbi.co. rrbi.co for your precious metals. There, as I mentioned before, Zen Cash. ZenSystem.io to learn all about this great new digital currency, um, and which is also a secure messaging application and document transfer uh, device and all the rest there. Learn all about it at ZenSystem.io. And read the book. It's by Hussein Badakhchani. It's how to run your tech business like a libertarian. That's not the title. The title is No Dev. No ops, no IT. Those are all one word each, if you take my meaning. No dev, no ops, no IT by Hussein Badakhchani. It's really great. And uh, check out libertystickers.com for all your anti-government propaganda. I made up most of them. And, uh, yeah, that didn't work out with the new website I kept promising you. But now, supposedly, someone else is promising one. So I guess we'll see if... We ever get a new website, but there's still a lot of great anti-government propaganda, and you could buy it at libertystickers.com. Now, one more thing. Check out scotthorton.org. We've been having some server problems, but otherwise, scotthorton.org is a great-looking new website, as you can tell. And if you want a good 2018 model website for your business or for whatever you're doing, your opinions, um, check out expanddesigns.com, the great Harley Abbott over there. And if you go to expanddesigns.com slash Scott, you'll save 500 bucks. Yeah, it's just like... Sending special operations forces to Mali after the coup that, well, that's against the law, but that's why it's a clandestine operation. So it doesn't matter. Um, right, right. So uh, the coup that was caused by the results of the war in Libya. I didn't mean to give that short shrift. Uh, hey, so, but now let me ask you this. Uh, because, I mean, what you just said is a pretty obvious answer to it. But I wonder if there's something more. The way the Israelis say, listen, uh, okay, yeah, we got nukes out of the side of their mouth, but we will not be the first country in the region to introduce nuclear weapons into the region. That's the way that they say it. I don't know what the word is in Hebrew or whatever, but that's how they say it here. Um, that, in other words, maybe, I don't know what you think of this, that um, what they're saying is they don't want to outright threaten their enemies. That We have nukes. It, they want to leave it a more subtle threat. I wonder if you think that that's a distinction without a difference, or it's, or if it maybe even really just comes down to this Arms Export Control Act and nothing else, you know? Well, that didn't exist when they first came up with that formulation. That formulation is the standard response, and it doesn't really mean anything because uh, all they have to do to meet that extremely high bar is to simply say, well... You know, the U.S. has sailed uh, nuclear armed aircraft carriers, you know, with bombs and missiles through the region several times. So they were the first to introduce, you know, what, what, all sorts. Yeah, of, And what difference does that make anyway? When, again, it, it, Mordecai Venunu came out to the Sunday Times in what year, 1981 or something? 
Yeah, yeah. So, well, 86, I believe. But okay. it, it was, he was the nuclear weapons whistleblower, but if you've never read that, it's in the Sunday Times. They still have it online. Right, exactly. And so it, it really, it doesn't mean anything. It's just uh, something to say whenever they're asked. And I believe Netanyahu even said that recently when he was buttonholed uh, by a reporter on CNN, no less, uh, asking him about right. Israel's own nuclear weapons. And it's just... Uh, you know, after saying that, which means nothing, he, as he did, he'll just say, and I'm not going to give you anything else on that. So, um, wasn't it's that very, an amazing interview, by the way? It was pretty this amazing. This is just yeah. what Phil Weiss is saying that Trump has so come to own the Israel issue and make it such a partisan Trumpian issue that it's really pushing liberal Americans, including liberal American Jews, away from Israel. If that's what Trump's into, that's what they're against. So CNN's party line is now so anti-Trump that it's even anti-Netanyahu in a way where I can I mean, somebody was telling him in his earpiece, yeah, go ahead and go after him, right? Which is just impossible. Right, right. Well, what a, you know, awesome time to be alive, man. Well, <laughs> I don't I don't think so, because you know, the thing that Entas doesn't go into and which is extremely important is why can Dermer come in, upset everybody, but still get his letter signed? Uh, why can Netanyahu, uh, again, be involved in nuclear uh, technology smuggling? It's it's in FBI documents and just never have him call called on it. It, it just it's this huge distortion which, of course, goes back to the lobby, which, uh, as I mentioned in the piece, if you add up the revenues of every single uh, U.S. nonprofit organization, this is not even counting uh, campaign contributions and pro-Israel PACs, it's a gigantic industry that's always pushing a very proactive agenda, which is exactly what I said before, you can never do enough for us meaning Israel in this case. Um, and so they can't, Trump can't stand up to that. Uh, Obama couldn't stand up to it either. And I spent a particular amount of time on the folding of Obama, who came in as Mr. Counterproliferation um, and who was going to Prague to talk about shoring up the nuclear nonproliferation treaty. There were talks of a Middle East nuclear free zone. And then suddenly he gets handed the letter and immediately collapses in May of 2009. Now, I didn't have that date before, uh, but that's Entaus's report saying it was in May of 2009, after the Prague speech about nuclear nonproliferation, that he yielded and signed his letter to the Israelis. Um, <laughs> and even worse, uh, and we're currently involved in litigation over this, on September 6, 2012, uh, his Department of Energy and Department of State issued a secret directive, and we've only got the title of it, called Guidance on Release of Information Relating to the Potential for an Israeli Nuclear Capability, um, which itself is secret. But it's basically a gag order that you mention this, you even quoting public domain stuff as a contractor or federal employee, you're going to get fired, your computer's going to be searched, mm -hmm. people are going to look at how they can charge you criminally. Uh, with leaking classified information, even if you quote Vanuna, as you said, or read the Sunday London Times and just quote from that, you'll still be fired. And that's or even quote happened. Colin Powell or the uh, current minority leader of the Senate, Charles Schumer. Right, exactly. Who's not a federal uh, agency employee, because if he were and uh, Sam Husseini had debriefed him so thoroughly at the National Press Club, getting him to admit that, uh, yes, they have nuclear weapons. He would be subject to WNP 136. He would have been fired. You know, if you were a high agency official, say at the Department of Energy, you had said that, he would have been out. He would have been out. He probably would have been prosecuted. Yeah, man. Um, you know what? I, th I think we've talked about this before, man. I'm sorry. I got holes in my brain. But uh, have you done polls? I, I think you have done polls on how many Americans know that Israel has nukes, right? Yeah, we uh, we did. Those are some of the first polls right after we found out that we could even do uh, statistically right. significant polls. It was back in 2014. Uh, we asked two questions on the 26th of September. One question was, 
do you believe Israel has nuclear weapons? And it was 64% of Americans said, yeah, of course we believe they do. Unfortunately, at the same time, if you ask the same question about Iran, 58, almost 59% also thought Iran had nuclear weapons in late 2014, which I think, uh, you know, if you were the Washington Institute for Near East Policy or Broad and Sanger, you would have said, yes, victory. We've Absolutely. successfully brainwashed Americans into believing something that's not true. So What a tragedy, man. That is just public, unreal. Public opinion polling is fascinating to see either what people know or what they absolutely don't know. Yeah. You know, it seems like, I mean, come on. If, if somebody has a Manhattan Project or not is something that you could know. I mean, to just settle for, like, your impression is there seems to be something there because people talk about it a lot or something, and to settle for that... And when it comes to, you know, basically what what serves as a phony cost of spelly, people, uh, grown adults need to be more responsible than that. There's such a thing as the IAEA, guys. They publish a thing every couple of weeks, you know. Right. And it's, you know, it's very solid work. But, uh, you know, the, the propaganda campaign around this, just as far as disparaging weapons inspectors, and then you've got this whole counter-proliferation think tank universe that's in Washington that is about as feckless as can be because they never really, I mean, they'll go ad nauseum into suspected Iranian sites, you know, suspected uh, explosion and implosion tests. I think you've gone over that with Gareth Porter. But, you know, whenever anything comes up on the Israeli nuclear weapons program, they're not the ones bringing it out. They don't do any analysis. They're basically configured to be against North Korea and Iran, and then by errors of omission, don't do any work on this at all. Yeah. Man, that's it's just incredible. Um, so, Grant, what's this $100 billion in the title? Yeah, it's a suspiciously round number, I admit, but that is the number you get if you add up all of the U.S foreign aid that the U.S. has given to Israel since Clinton signed his first uh, letter or his administration agreed to ignore Israel's nuclear weapons in violation of the Arms Export Control Act. So if you add up every year and adjust it for inflation, it comes out to $99.9 .9 billion. And if you really go back a little further to 1976, when these amendments to the Foreign Assistance Act uh, went into effect banning U.S. aid to proliferators and demanding public waivers if aid was to be given, then you find that the sum of U.S. aid was $222.8 billion adjusted for inflation, uh, which is a lot of money. And it makes this a major conspiracy. This is Teapot Dome. This is uh, Tammany Hall. This is an extremely big bipartisan corruption scandal that's been uh, involving U.S. administrations and federal agencies that are complicit in this since 1976. Hey, let me ask you this. Do you think Trump is qualitatively more committed to Zionism or at least to Netanyahu and Sheldon Adelson and their policies than previous presidents? I do. I mean, I Bush and Sharon for the most worst recent example. I think if you add up all of the giveaways and all of the damage that's been done to U.S., uh, you know, U.S. commitments to international law, U.S. commitments to the United Nations, uh, if, if you believe uh, that it is important to have a United Nations and if you believe that this uh, founding principle that there be a negotiated settlement before you did anything like open embassies or recognize uh, Jerusalem as a capital, uh, yeah, he's basically blown up the United Nations. And so, yes, I do believe well, that see, he is. Now yeah. you're convincing me to really like the guy after all. I mean, well, yeah, because I hate the UN. And uh, uh -huh. I don't want any part of it. But, yeah, as a as a silver lining, it's not good enough to justify what's going on in Palestine, not by a long shot to me. Yeah, I mean, if you also look at it from the side of 
What about fairness? What about uh, at least trying to have some sort of settlement looking at the original division? Yeah, I look uh, at it like the individual rights of the Palestinians sure. as human look beings. From a simple as rights. that. You know, that's what's really the, at question here, you know? Abs- absolutely. So, uh, and in terms of U.S. interests, I mean, obviously, this article says they've been bad uh, since Clinton, you know, passing through Bush. I mean, they've all basically uh, undermined the United States. And maybe you can make the argument uh, there as well that uh, we obviously shouldn't have been giving this foreign aid. And if we hadn't, the U.S. would have a lot more leverage and probably uh, a lot more peace in the region. But instead, we continue to fund one side by violating our own laws. So there you have it. All right. Well, thanks very much for coming back on the show and talking about this very important subject with us. I know it gets through to people, man. People tell me straight to my face, I did an event over the weekend, and they say to me, hey, on this Israel-Palestine stuff, I get it now from listening to you, and I know that that means listening to me interview you. So thanks, No, no. Hey, thank you, Scott. Glad to be on. Have a good one, brother. All right, you guys, and that's the show. You know me, scotthorton.org, youtube.com slash scotthortonshow, libertarianinstitute.org, and uh, buy my book, and it's now available in audiobook as well, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. Hey, it's endorsed by Ron Paul and Daniel Ellsberg and Stephen Walt and Peter Van Buren and Matthew Ho and Daniel Davis and Anand Gopal and Patrick Coburn. And Eric Margulies, you'll like it. Fool's Air and Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And uh, follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks, guys.